And welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here for the monthly webinar from the Future of Freedom Foundation with Sheldon Richmond. For those of you who somehow don't know, Sheldon is the Vice President of the Future of Freedom Foundation and the editor of their monthly journal, Future of Freedom. And uh, for 15 years, he was the editor of The Freeman, uh, published by the Foundation for Economic Education. He's the author of several books, including Separating School and State, How to Liberate America's Families, and Your Money or Your Life, Why We Must Abolish the Income Tax. And he is widely published on just about everything. He has a, a wonderful uh, column every Friday uh, called TGIF. And this week he's been particularly incensed by uh, by libertarian straw men, the, the straw men we see of libertarians in the media. And he's going to be talking about that. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. Well, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks again. Great to be here. Uh, you can't see it, but I'm wearing my, uh, I'll show you, my free market uh, socialist button. So it's a great um, conversation starter in the supermarket checkout lines. So I highly recommend it. Uh, well, yeah, Matt, Matt is right. Um, it seems like every few months there's a really idiotic article that uh, in very somber tones uh, 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 ostensibly uh, rebuts, refutes, demolishes libertarianism. And there's a, usually a common uh, element to all these articles. They totally misunderstand libertarianism. It's hard to believe it's a mistake or an accident. Uh, and I've uh, I've taken on quite a few of them myself. Sometimes I feel like uh, now I have to do another one. It's like a task, but but it does seem worth it. It's some, somewhat satisfying. I don't think it makes any dent on the in the other side. They never bother really to uh, follow up and and show where the uh, our debunking is wrong. But um, I guess it's a game you play. So we'll see we'll see if it keeps up. Uh, uh, but I uh, so I'll talk I'll talk a little bit about the last one that I that I took on. Uh, now you know maybe I'm being unreasonable, but I think it behooves a critic to understand what it is he's criticizing. That that doesn't seem like too crazy a demand. Uh, uh, it's true that tackling a straw man is much easier than dealing with challenging arguments, but that's no excuse for the sort of shoddy work we find in uh, John Edward Terrell's New York uh, Times post from about two weeks ago called Evolution and the American myth of the individual. I think you can already see where uh, John Edward Terrell is going. He's an academic, by the way, at the University, I believe the University of Illinois, Chicago. Now, in his confused attempt to criticize libertarians, uh, he also criticized the Tea Party, but I won't say anything about them here. Uh, in his confused attempt to criticize libertarians, uh, Terrell gets one thing right when he says, quote, the thought that it is both rational and natural for each of us to care only for ourselves, our own preservation, and our own achievements is a treacherous fabrication, close quote. To which I say, indeed it is. Unfortunately for Terrell's case, it's his treacherous fabrication. Now, Terrell targets the Enlightenment, and in particular Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, in his uh, case against libertarianism, which is doubly funny. Libertarians don't claim Rousseau as a rule. Uh, as one of their forebears. Uh, he was an advocate of imposing the general will, the so-called general will, which is ascertained through democratic procedures on dissidents as a means of, as uh, Rousseau put it, forcing them to be free. So I asked Mr. Terrell, Dr. Terrell, Professor Terrell, whether that sounds very libertarian. Does that sound like something libertarians uh, sign on to? As for the Enlightenment, which he indicts as a as, uh, excessively individualistic, I guess. Last I checked, Adam Smith was a principal of the Scottish wing of the, that intellectual movement. And he would never have claimed that, that, quote, it is both rational and natural for each of us to care only for ourselves, our own preservation, and our own achievements. I'm not aware of uh, French Enlightenment economists who thought that either, by the way. So has Terrell never heard of Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments, published in uh, 1859? at 17 years before the wealth of nations and uh, smith revised this book throughout his life up to the year he died i believe uh, or is uh, terrell in that group of scribblers who think the wealth of nations was all that smith had to say about the human enterprise and i'll add here that of course the wealth of nations also does not embrace the view that uh, terrell ascribes to libertarians 
For Terrell's edification, let me point out that the theory of moral sentiments is an extended discussion of what, what the Smith calls fellow feeling, that is our natural sympathy for others. Smith would laugh at any portrayal of the isolated, allegedly self-sufficient individual as the summit of human development. No less than the Greek uh, philosophers, Adam, uh, Adam Smith understood how inherently social the individual person is. The self itself is a product of social life. People, he said, seek praise from their fellows and importantly, aspire to be worthy of praise. As he puts it, quote, what's so happiness as to be beloved and to know that we deserve to be loved? What's so misery as to be hated and to know that we deserve to be hated? Smith asks. The reason he makes clear is not merely that a good reputation produces material benefits. As he writes on the first page of the Theory of Moral Sentiments, quote, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their necessary their, their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. By coincidence, just before reading Terrell's post, I had listened to Russ Roberts' econ talk interview with Vernon Smith, the Nobel laureate who is steeped in the economics tradition of Adam Smith and F.A. Hayek. The topic of discussion was the theory of moral sentiments, which is entirely appropriate considering that Roberts and uh, Vernon Smith are two of the small group of professional economists who are intimately familiar with that other Smith's uh, book, first book. Another, by the way, is Dan Klein, with whom Roberts held a multi-part book club discussion on Econ Talk. You can find that uh, that website for uh, with all the back uh, uh, episodes of Econ Talk, and I recommend those on uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments, but as, as a general rule, I uh, recommend uh, uh, this this weekly podcast. I've, I've called it the podcast of the humility in economics movement, and I mean that as a compliment. Uh, while you're at it, check out Robert's new book. He has a new book about the Theory of Moral Sentiments called How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, An Unexpected Guide to Human Nature and Happiness. So you might uh, enjoy that book. Uh, so, at one point in the interview, Vernon Smith, with enthusiasm, says to Russ Roberts, Adam Smith says, imagine a person, a member of, a, of the species, being brought up entirely isolated. He, sa he says that a person, meaning Adam Smith says that a person can no more understand what it means for his mind to be deformed than for his face to be deformed. And, Smith says, I'm, par I'm still quoting Vernon Smith. It's a little confusing here. We've got too many Smiths here. And Adam Smith says, I'm paraphrasing, Vernon Smith says, bring him into society and you give him the mirror he needed before. In other words, the looking glass in which we're able to see ourselves as others see us. Close quote. Thus, society is indispensable for the proper development of the person. Uh, this is in Adam Smith. Adam Smith is at the heart of the. Uh, Enlightenment tradition, which uh, libertarians and classical liberals have drawn on for uh, for many years, something apparently uh, John Terrell doesn't doesn't know about. Vernon Smith has also written in an essay called "The Two Faces of Adam Smith," written in 1998, that Adam Smith's two published works both describe quote one behavioral axiom: the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. That's a quote out of the Wealth of Nations the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another, where the objects of trade I will interpret to include not only uh, goods, but also gifts, assistance, and uh, favors out of sympathy. I'm still quoting uh, Vernon Smith here. Whether it is goods or favors that are exchanged, they bestow gains from trade that humans seek relentlessly in all social transactions. Thus, Adam Smith's single axiom, broadly interpreted, is sufficient to characterize a major portion of the human and social enterprise. It explains why human nature appears to be simultaneously self-regarding and other-regarding, close quote. So I ask you, does it sound as though either of the Smiths would be inclined to deny, as Terrell puts it, that, quote, evolution has made us a powerfully social species, uh, so much so that the essential precondition of human survival is and always has been the individual plus his or her relationships with others. So keep in mind that Terrell is saying that libertarians would deny that statement. Uh, has Terrell not heard of Adam Smith or Vernon Smith? 
or F.A. Hayek or James Buchanan. Those were two Nobel laureates, so their names were in the newspapers. Or Russ Roberts or Dan Klein. And while we're at it, let's drop the name Herbert Spencer. Yes, the horrible Herbert Spencer. I'm sure Terrell, uh, uh, Terrell's uh, uh, head would be exploding by my invoking uh, Herbert Spencer here. But here's what Herbert, Spen Herbert Spencer wrote in his first book in 1851. The increasing assertion of personal rights is an increasing demand that the external conditions needful to a complete unfolding of the individuality shall be respected. Yet this higher individuation be joined with the greatest mutual dependence. Paradoxical, though, uh, though the assertion looks, the progress is at once toward complete separateness and complete union. But the separateness is of a kind consistent with the most complex combinations for fulfilling social wants. And the union is a kind that does not hinder entire development of each personality. Civilization is, a, uh, is evolving a state of things and a, character, and a kind of character in which two apparently conflicting requirements are reconciled. And, and, and Spencer anticipated what he, what, he said, what he called at once perfect individuation and perfect mutual dependence, close quote. If Terrell has never uh, uh, encountered these thinkers, how much research could he have done before he opined about libertarianism? Don't forget, he's out to debunk libertarianism. So why should we take Terrell seriously at all? I wish I could understand intellectuals who seem to form a priori notions about their opponents, do no empirical research to see if those notions hold up, and then go public with criticisms that should embarrass them badly. If I may say something in the spirit of uh, the theory of moral sentiments, I am embarrassed that a fellow member of the human race has written something so ridiculous. It embarrasses me. What people like Terrell, Terrell don't realize, or perhaps realize too well, is that the fundamental point in dispute is not whether the individual is a social animal or a creature best suited for an atomistic uh, existence. No libertarian I know of subscribes to the latter notion, that of atomistic uh, individualism. I've called the more appropriate model a molecular individualism. So the point that's in dispute is not this business about whether uh, human beings are social or not. That's not in dispute. The point of dispute is whether proper social life should be founded on peaceful consensual cooperation or on compulsion. And in this regard, I'll plug an article of mine called uh, C, uh, sorry, uh, What Social Animals Owe to Each Other. You can find that, that at the uh, free, Future Freedom site, FFF.org. Just put in that title what so, or just Google it. What Social Animals Owe to Each Other and where I uh, validate what I call the non-aggression uh, obligation. It's been called an axiom, it's been called a principle, it's been called a maxim, but I think it's best called a, uh, an obligation. Terrell asserts a dubious distinction between thinking of society as natural and thinking of society, uh, thinking of society as a matter merely of convention. And uh, I say it's a dubious distinction and even a doubt, of doubtful significance uh, because uh, the conventionalist thinker, let's think of David Hume perhaps, uh, still believes that given their nature, only a social existence generated by certain conventions is appropriate for human beings. So even if you take the position that the society is a matter of convention, uh, it's not, it doesn't follow that any convention is, is appropriate for human beings. Uh, so I, I think actually you can say that the the uh, conventional view, the conventionalist view, and the naturalist view collapse really in our, our really one view. But if for argument's sake we accept uh, Terrell's distinction and his preference for naturalism, and I'm not against it, uh, we still must ask if society is natural, why must uh, we be compelled to be social? Why is aggressive force, the initiation, the initiation of violence, which robs persons of their dignity and self-determination, acceptable when free and spontaneous uh, cooperation, voluntary exchange, and mutual aid ought to work reasonably well. Do the Tyrells of the world believe that society would fail without violence? Uh, if so, I submit that that is bizarre. It is precisely because human beings are social by nature 
that physical force should be banned except to repel aggressors and to effect restitution for torts. So I welcome the day that someone writes a serious criticism of liberalism, libertarianism, that reflects a real understanding of what is being criticized. Terrell and like-minded folks would expect that of their critics. So how about applying the golden rule, guys? Go home, do your homework, then come back and give us your best shot, and I promise I'll be waiting. Um, now, since I wrote that article, uh, we got the sad news that uh, Nathaniel Brandon had uh, uh, passed away. And uh, I did follow up uh, last Friday with an article on, on Brandon, my, some of my own uh, uh, observations about him. Uh, I didn't know him well, but, but my, my own uh, meager contact with him. And I wanted to say that uh, he's another person I could have cited in uh, this uh, rebuttal to Terrell, because Brandon in his writings stresses both the uh, individuality and sociality of uh, human the human beings. That we, we, we couldn't live as human beings outside of society, but that at the same time doesn't mean a quashing of individuality, of self, of self uh, uh, assertiveness, of, in, uh, of independence of thought, uh, and, all, and all those other things. It goes back to this only apparent paradox that Spencer uh, uh, wrote about, and how in fact it's a paradox that is easily resolved, that human beings are individuals and they require uh, other human beings for, for their uh, tax or actualize their ma their maximum potential. Uh, I'm going to stop now so we can open this up for uh, conversation or questions or whatever you like to do. Uh, I hope that was provocative enough to get us going, and uh, I'll stop there. Over the years, uh, I'll get us started with questions. Over the, over the years, what do you think has been the most pervasive kind of meme that leftists have come out with? Is it the kind of, oh, libertarians are all uh, only selfish and they only look at themselves. They're, you know, this kind of uber individualist who is a hermit or whatever. Is, is that it or is it something else? Uh, well, that's certainly, it may not, there may not be one. That's a, that's a big one. And uh, it's, it's an easy uh, way to scare people off who don't know much about libertarianism. Or, or even uh, objectivism, and uh, it's a it's a good way to say, look, you don't want to read that stuff. These people are antisocial. They're you know uh, they think they uh, any every individual should and can make it make it on his own. They you know they uh, they have this uh, caricature of self reliance. I mean, there's a good sense of self reliance, but you could also twist it into something that's totally inappropriate, right? I, I like to use the example of uh, I like to say that you know the libertarian ideal is not Ted Kaczynski without the letter bombs. If you remember the Unabomber, he lived up in this shack somewhere, I don't know where, in Montana, someplace, uh, all alone on a mountaintop in a ramshackle, uh, run-down hut, uh, and, uh, you know, never had any contact with people, off the grid and all that, and, uh, of course, he was sending out letter bombs, which, of course, uh, I guess even, uh, even John Terrell would have to say is not a libertarian thing to do, so that's why I say without the letter bombs, but I, I don't know many libertarians who think that's the ideal existence. Even even if some and uh, choose that way of living, it, 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 they're trying to get away of, uh, from current society. And so, uh, I don't think most libertarians would want to do that or see that as a proper uh, uh, way to live. So yeah, that's I think that's right. It's a good way to scare people off. Uh, now I I will say out of fairness that sometimes libertarians have led uh, the critics or non-libertarians to believe that that is the model. I think some some statements are not quite carefully uh, uh, drawn and. And you can uh, you can uh, you can emphasize parts in Rand that do seem to imply that and that so in some ways we using a vague we here now have given uh, our opponents uh, ammunition maybe unwittingly so I think we need to be a little more conscious of that and uh, don't be afraid to mention the theory of moral sentiments it's a, it's a book worth looking at uh, I won't claim to have read the whole thing yet but that's something I certainly aspire to do but you'll get this the spirit of it very early in the book. Uh, and uh, uh, we shouldn't just neglect that side of it. I mean, I think there are times when libertarians have neglected it, but it is it is not absent from the serious thinkers, the people who have written. I mean, look, we're interested in economics. What's economics? Economics is about exchange. Exchange is social cooperation. The division of labor is social cooperation. You know, human action, the second most uh, uh, 
uh, used phrase in human action is social cooperation. I, I used to speculate that, that was the case. I figured division of labor was the first most common phrase. And then a friend of mine actually subjected it to one of these computer programs that could count phrases. And I was right. Social cooperation is second. Division of labor is first. But the division of labor is just another way of saying social cooperation. So we're all about social cooperation. We think that is the proper way to live, that there's a, unlimited benefits of both the material and non-material kind. And so this is a crazy charge to throw at libertarian. Do you think that the language that Rand used, particularly uh, praising selfishness, which, I mean, it, certainly she's using it differently there than most people use it. She's, uh, she's kind of saying that, uh, I don't know, yeah. I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, you know, and she says, if you look at the introduction to that collection, she says, uh, somebody was asking her, why are you picking that title? And her answer was, for the very reasons you're asking, you're afraid of it. So she was a, she was doing sort of an in-your-face move. I think you have to keep in mind that the, the time she was writing, you know, at La Shrug, the late 50s or through the 50s and then into the 60s, where you had uh, uh, political figures and religious figures and just general cultural figures praising self-sacrifice as the ideal, as the duty, as the justification for the individual live, of being alive. And so she she wanted to counter that. And so you can see where you might, if you're not careful, fall into uh, uh, diminishing uh, the social side of things. Uh, you know, I wish she, you know, and, 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 you know, it's been a while since I've read carefully through all her stuff. You may well be able to come up with uh, passages which would satisfy uh, what my complaint here. It would have been nice if there was something like the like what I read from Spencer. Spencer's very upfront in social in social status, where he says, "Look, this looks this seems like a paradox, but it's not. How are you can have this perfect individuality and perfect uh, social dependence, and neither one quashes the other one." So, uh, yeah, you know, we can hold her responsible. I don't want to be too tough on her for this, because I think you have to look at the milieu somebody is writing in, and uh, so I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe someone else will. Your thoughts. Some. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker asks, Sheldon, your article on Brandon was absolutely wonderful, and I'm sure that, of course, you read the New York Times piece, and I'm sure you read the wicked material in the uh, LA Times, so ghastly. Why do you suppose that, uh, sorry, I've, the question cuts off on this screen. Uh, why do you suppose those were published? Why the hate? Can you make sense of the motivation? Well, I, you know, I, the intelligentsia has, uh, you know, I've just not been able to stomach libertarianism and Rand in particular all these all these years, and so uh, uh, when they got when they've gotten their chance to uh, to do an obituary, they they figured the best way to show their disdain is to play up uh, the uh, you know the sorted events involving uh, Nathaniel Brandon and Ayn Rand, and you know, I'm, I'm not gonna defend how they treated other people. Uh, it was pointed out, I guess I saw something from, on Facebook today that uh, that Brandon's uh, widow wrote to the LA Times complaining about that that rather ugly uh, obituary that when they did an obituary a year, a year ago for Barbara Brandon, they actually handled it uh, quite a bit differently, uh, more respectfully. I don't, I don't remember the obituary, but uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they felt uh, maybe there was some sexism there. They thought, well, we don't want to be too tough on a woman, but you know, Nathaniel Brandon, we can go after. He's a man after all. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I just think all this uh, venom comes out because they 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 don't understand or they don't want to understand uh, the libertarian approach. So they have to smear it as as atomistic individualism and you know hermit hermitism. And uh, this was a great opportunity for them to uh, you know point out all the ugly stuff and say very little about uh, uh, the positive stuff. I mean, I tried to uh, rectify some of that in my own piece, which, you know, I'll happy to recommend to people. If you haven't read it, please take a look. You can find that at FFF.org. It's also on Reason, Reason.com this week. And it's also been posted in the chat here. Our next question is from Wesley. He asks, how can we encourage a dialogue with these critics? 
Well, I, you know, I try to do that. I, I, I try to write respectfully. I, 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 I got I have to admit my, uh, maybe my other side got the better of me at the end of this article uh, where I said, uh, go home and do your homework and come back and I'll be, I'll be waiting. That maybe was a little uh, condescending, but I, got, I was getting a little annoyed. I mean, I, I tried to seriously engage him. I don't know. And I posted the link to that article uh, at the New York Times uh, uh, blog where his his post was. They allowed comments. I never heard anything. I didn't even go back to look to see if it was actually posted because it doesn't immediately uh, post. I guess they have to moderate it. So I, I don't know. if it, I assume it's there. I haven't gotten any email not, not uh, letting me know that, it, that it's there. Uh, you know, occasionally you do hear from a critic, or I have heard. I, I, I wrote a... Uh, uh, a refutation of criticism by Matt Matt Brunig uh, from I forget where he published that Salon or I think it was Salon maybe and um, he wrote a follow up but it was a follow up as if I had never written my article so it was a rather odd follow up so there was no no good faith engagement there I try to engage these these uh, these people in good faith but I don't think they're interested in that I think it would upset their world view to say you know what maybe I misjudged these guys. Now they just have, they just are much more comfortable believing that libertarians are, you know, Gordon Gecko without even Gordon Gecko's ma good manners. I guess. I should probably tell people how they can ask questions. If you have a question for Sheldon, there's a little box in the upper right that says Q and A. Just type your question in there, and we'll get to it. Uh, Bart asks. Do you have a reading list for those looking to pursue this line of thought, I guess, other than like theory of moral sentiments? Uh, hi, Bart. Um, well, I don't, I don't have a formal list, but if you look through articles that I've done on social cooperation, both at uh, FFF.org and then previously at FEE, FEE.org, where I wrote a few articles by, by the title Social Cooperation, Part 1, Part 2, Part 3, I forgot how many, uh, you'll find lots of links and books mentioned. Uh, I mean, there's a whole, there's a host of them. There's the French economists from the 19th century, the early 19th century, uh, the people that were inspired by uh, Smith, but but by J. B. Say, uh, Bastiat, uh, Henry Hazlitt. I mean, you, you'll find many, many people uh, mentioned. So uh, that that constitutes a reading list. Yeah, if you you have to do a little digging, but you'll it won't be hard to find things. Now. When we're going about responding to these articles, when our non-libertarian friends post them on Facebook, do you have any advice for how we engage? Because a lot of times there's such this, such a massive disconnect. People are, are talking past each other. Uh, a lot of people don't share our priors and a lot of libertarians don't know how to communicate with non-libertarians. What are your suggestions? Well, I think, uh assume good faith on the other side even if you have a sneaking suspicion is not there because i think that'll serve you well so be respectful you know don't call names uh take them seriously and that may be reciprocated so that's that's the object there uh be patient you know don't get don't get mad don't assume uh too much knowledge on the part of either that reader or the audience and you know the, you you may never even reach the, uh, uh, the the person you're responding to, but you got you have spectators, so they're the ones you're you're playing to, and uh, assume a lot of them are not libertarians. So so uh, spell things out. Don't don't assume they already uh, know. So good manners. Just be reasonable and show good manners, and uh, you know that's the best you can do, and be as clear and articulate as you can, and. Uh, and you know, be be honest, be honest and respectful. I mean, it's sort of basic advice you'd give almost for any occasion. Do you think that libertarians often fall into the trap of, of not assuming the best about their opponent's arguments? And do you think that we might have a better time if we at least try to, you know, have the assumption that our our opponents are not complete idiots? Yeah, you know, I'm a big fan of Socrates, and and what Socrates used to do, you know, as he walked through the uh, agora uh, in uh, in uh, Athens, would be uh, he'd engage people in conversation, and what he tried to do was to show that uh, you know on the question of justice or virtue or you know some some subject like that, he'd show that they held some sound and noble belief about the subject, but at the same time they also held 
conflicting uh, uh, less than noble beliefs. And he tried to show how they can uh, uh, reconcile this by uh, modifying or throwing out altogether the the you know the not the the ignoble belief that conflicted with the noble belief, and and then bring them to a better understanding. As a result, he did through questioning, mainly questioning, respectful questioning. Uh, that's a much better method than condemning someone as a hypocrite. I mean, uh, you know, you often hear libertarians say to uh, you know a left winger, "Ah, oh, you care about the poor, but um, so how come you know?" And then X Y Z, you know, name the libertarian position. You're a hypocrite. Uh, you don't usually win someone over by accusing uh, him or her of being a hypocrite. That's not, that's not really designed to attract uh, listeners and, uh, and and get people to rethink. I think it rather it's better to take the Socratic approach. To you know, everybody to some extent, virtually everybody to some extent, ha has an idea about the dignity of the individual. I mean, there are very few people who think the individual should have no rights whatsoever. That somehow authority or society as a whole should totally own and dictate to the individual what he can do. I don't know if there's anybody that takes that, that position. I mean, Mussolini did, but you know, there aren't a lot of people like Mussolini. Uh, and so you, you, you need to find that libertarian element in people. Uh, you know, I, 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 I wrote an article previously, uh, I think at FFF.org that, you know, most people are already sort of halfway to libertarianism because they practice libertarianism in their own lives by and large. Right, they would never go rob from their neighbor, or even to give to a starving person. They would realize there's something wrong with that. You have to use persuasion, not force. Uh, they just have different rules when it comes to the state, and there may be uh, different reasons for that. But we need to bring them to the understanding that there shouldn't be different rules. There's only one moral code, and it applies to everybody, all individuals, whether they have a government office or not. And so that's what we need to look at. Look at look for in people, and then build on that. Draw that out and say, but don't you see how that doesn't quite fit with this other position you have? That's that would be a Socratic approach, and I think that has a better chance of succeeding than uh, one of uh, you know being uh, claiming you're holier than thou or, or more libertarian than thou, and uh, you know denouncing people as uh, hypocrites. Wesley asks, should we take these impotent critiques as a sign that we're gaining strength and catching more people's attention? Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's crossed my mind now and then. Why do they? Why are they so busy attacking the position? Uh, they, they seem to be afraid that it has the potential to really spread. And of course, it's talked about more than it's ever been, you know, in the news media. You know, uh, a lot of you, I guess, are too young to remember this, but I can remember you'd never hear the word libertarian in a news talk, you know, discussion on television. Uh, even when there was a there was a, even when the libertarian party had already been set up you still didn't hear it discussed that word was never used so there's been a lot of progress even though it's not really understood but it has broken through we got to give ron paul a lot of credit for this but it's it has broken through in some ways and it gets a serious discussion uh again even if it's imperfectly understood but i think that is a matter of progress and so i guess we could we can gauge our success by how often we're attacked it may seem like an odd thing to do but it does give us a, give us openings right it gives us things to write about and uh it gives us a chance to leave comments at websites uh, and uh, let's let's make the most of it i lost i'm not hearing you matt Sorry, I uh, had the mic muted. Do you think that libertarians are making inroads in academia? Uh, yeah, I'm not as close to that as I used to be. I worked for IHS for five years uh, in the latter half of the 80s, so I, I saw that more close up. That's been going on for some time, though, because of IHS and, and other efforts. Uh, so there are, yeah, there are uh, professors and uh, I think a huge crop of really bright younger ones who are scattered in universities and colleges all over the country so uh, yeah that seems to still be going strong and probably what has changed so much for the better there is uh they're probably a, they're probably in a wider variety of disciplines than they used to be i mean there was a time when libertarians were only economists and and uh, and then some philosophers uh but that's that's different now you you can find uh, people in english departments and sociology and uh, you know a lot of other disciplines so yeah i think there is progress there 
Uh, Jeffrey Tucker asks, you know, this really does represent a big shift in libertarian culture. Most libertarians are wildly confrontational and angry a lot of the time. Do you worry that being more humane might tempt libertarians to be less principled? And how do you strike a balance? Uh, I don't really see the danger there, how being humane can induce you to be less principled. Jeff's going to be very surprised to hear me say that, right? He's fallen out of his seat. Uh, get back up. Uh, I don't see the conflict. Uh, libertarianism, liberalism, to use the broader term, and I still like the sound of that. I haven't surrendered to that word yet. Uh, is a humane philosophy. What was, I mean, think. Think back about the development of the philosophy, how it emerged out of the struggles between, you know, people and crown and and people and uh, over, uh, uh, you know, a burdensome dictatorial or I should say that oppressive church. I mean, all, all forms of oppression. It grew out of that, you know, cauldron. Uh, that's how that's how uh, philosophy emerges. Political philosophy emerges. Not some guy thinking, sitting in his study quietly writing uh, uh, a treatise of, of government. Uh, uh, as important as those things can be. Those things usually are after the fact. They record what pe the way people are living, and then they distill it into, into some more abstract terms. But it comes out of struggle. And so the struggle was one to, uh, it was a humane struggle to establish the right of individuals to live their own lives. I mean, uh, you know, the the Brandon article, if, you have, if people haven't seen it, just to quickly describe it, the first few hundred words of that article are not even about Brandon. And if Brandon's name weren't in the title, you I don't think you'd know where I was going with it. It was about the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, and Jefferson, why Jefferson chose to put that into the Declaration, which is an interesting subject. So I recommend the article to you, and there's some links you can go on and read more about this. George Smith has written about it. Uh, other people have written about it. Uh, what, think about that phrase for a second. It's saying the individual has a right to pursue his or her own happiness. What, what could be more humane? I mean, the, the, the fact that we have to, are thrown on the defensive and have to uh, establish that libertarianism or liberalism is a humane, a main, humane philosophy is really laughable when you think about it. But like I said, we need to be patient with our uh, adversaries and, uh, and don't forget other people are watching. So you may not, you may not persuade the adversary. But there's a gallery, and you may persuade them. Hope I answered. Yeah. So question. often I find that I'm not arguing for uh, I'm not arguing for the person I'm arguing with. I don't know that I've ever convinced someone who was invested in the argument on the other side. But you know, there are so many people out there watching, especially in in places like Facebook. Uh, Bart asks, Do you consider Jeffrey Tucker to be an angry libertarian? <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's the most angry person I ever met. Man, you don't want to cross Jeffrey Tucker. <laughs> no, that's sarc sarcasm. I have to put in brackets, you know, sarcasm. JK. JK slash K. Uh, do you really want me to talk about Jeffrey Tucker? I, I will go way past the hour. Uh, I've known Jeffrey Tucker since uh, 1985 or so. And there was a stretch when we actually worked in the same town, Fairfax, Virginia. He had a uh, office. Uh, he was the uh, the outpost in the nation's capital or near it uh, for a uh, uh, an institute from that's in Auburn, Alabama that shall remain uh, nameless. And I was working for the Institute for Humane Study and Studies. And it's no exaggeration to say that we had lunch together five days a week, almost without exception. Jeff will remember. I want him to speak up and vouch for this. The Black IP, uh, Pizza Hut, where we used to go, Jeff. And we did a lot of development, self-development and mutual, uh, you know, discussions and, and learning. It was a very important five years in my life. And I, I hope, you, I hope uh, Jeff would say the same thing. I remember being at his house with Murray Rothbard once. <laughs> oh, wow. I must say, I, I was going to say I'm jealous, but now I don't think jealous covers it. Uh, Wesley asks, if a libertarian were to be given a public forum with a significant a significant audience in which to respond to these objections, what's the most efficient argument they could make to inspire people to look into the philosophy? Well, I hadn't really thought of the question that way. That's uh, this is interesting. I may have to take some time on that and get back to you the most efficient way. Uh, I think appealing to the humaneness may be 
I mean, and, and there's going to be different answers for different people. Let me back up a second. I really think you have to read your uh, interlocutor or your audience because people respond differently. I did an article uh, last year, I think, about the aesthetics of the free market, the aesthetics of libertarianism, because I had an experience at a Q&A session with a uh, with a, a woman, an older woman who was challenging me about money and markets. And, uh, and it made me see it was sort of an epiphany that for some people who are not really theoretically inclined, it's not their style, and maybe they haven't done a, a lot of theoretical reading and thinking over the years, but there are people who have an aesthetic aversion to markets. They think there's something ugly, unattractive about it. And you have to talk to that person differently than you're going to talk to someone who's a, you know, who prides, prides himself or herself on, on uh, understanding economic theory or, or moral theory. Uh, you got to talk to that other person differently because it's an aesthetic and you need to portray what I, what did I call it? The beauty of the market. I forget what I called the article about the beauty of social cooperation. I think Jeff is probably nodding his head because I learned, I learn a lot from what Jeff writes on things like this. There's something beautiful in exchange, in free exchange. Hey, we can get together and both benefit through this peaceful interaction. And, and of course, the interaction need not be strictly material, like uh, Vernon Smith was saying about Adam Smith. The exchange can involve a lot of different things and be in the form of gifts, and, you know, and, uh, and, and, and other kinds of uh, uh, give and take. So it's much broader than just being in the marketplace or the stock market. Uh, so uh, there's going to be a different answer for different people. I can't give a pat answer to what's the most efficient way or best way to approach somebody. You have to kind of know your the person you're talking to, which is a challenge because you got, obviously you're not getting a lot of time, but be perceptive about the hints that people leave and what they say. Listen to other people. There's maybe the thing. Listen to them. I know we've heard the same objections over and over again. Look, I fall, I fall for this myself too. I hope I'm a little better than, than I was in my younger days. But you hear an objection you've heard 50 times and you're ready to pounce, right? Because you already know you know, minimum wage or something, you already got it. You got the little index card up here and you got you pull it out and you're already ready to pounce. Hold back, take a breath, let the person finish and pay attention to the words and the tone and, and make sure you're responding. We often do talk past each other. Make sure you're responding to what the person is saying and what the person's concerns are. That's my best advice. Scott, Scott asks, is it really practicable uh, practical to focus on the audience in the digital age where your audience may be someone you didn't even intend to talk to. Yeah, that's that's a good challenge and it's something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, but you got to look, you got to, if you're going to write something, you got to write something. So you, you can't drive yourself crazy with, well, who's going to see this and it's going to be online, you know, 20 years from now. And so I have to write for the ages. You make yourself nuts and never write anything. So don't let that get out of hand. Uh, try to keep a fairly identifiable audience in mind that you think is a reasonable group to approach, that you have a reasonable chance of, uh, you know, making some impression on. And then, you know, if other people are going to see it, if it falls flat with them, you know, well, well, you could, you can't talk to everybody, uh, you know, in every article. Uh, I think writers, I put this on Facebook once, I think writers get in trouble anytime they think, Anytime they aspire to write the last word on something, I think that's uh, something to keep in mind. You'll get another shot. It's not going to be the only time you'll write on it. You'll come back. To, if, you're, if you're a writer, you'll come back to the topics again and again, and you'll think of different angles to approach uh, a given issue that was different from the first time. So just keep that in mind. You get it, A writer gets in trouble uh, anytime he inspires, aspires to um, say the last word on a subject. Do you think that libertarians get too caught up in the words that they're using and don't worry enough about the commun what they're communicating with the words they're using? Well, I, I, there shouldn't be a conflict. Uh, I think you need to think about, this is a, this is a good topic. It's something I've been meaning to write about. You, I think you need to be sensitive to how people hear the words you're using because you may have different connotations for words than that a non-libertarian has. Uh, 
I mean, exa here's, here's an example. This was what I was going to use in the when I thought about writing this article, which I haven't written yet. I these are the kind of examples I think of. We like to talk about uh, uh, the evils of centralized power, and that you know the national government, and uh, not getting now into anarchism versus minarchism, but but we would see it tend to see it as progress to to decentralize power and have smaller jurisdictions, if for no other reason, as I like to say, then, then it cuts the cost of voting with your feet, right? It's easier to move from one town to another than to go out of the country. But we have to be sensitive how some other people hear that. Don't forget what the, uh, this country's history was about. Uh, in, as a lot of people understand it, and, and, there's, and, and I'm not saying this is wrong, there's a lot of truth to it, uh, Local governments and state governments, certainly uh, in the South, were enforcing slavery, and you know, so was the national government. But what broke up slavery, and it was done in a horrible way, obviously. I'm not uh, not saying the Civil War was, the, was any way to do this, but I'm just talking about what actually happened. People attribute the eradication of slavery and then later the eradication of, of uh, Jim Crow to the national government. So if we just sort of blindly attack the national government, we don't know what trigger, what thoughts and associations we're triggering in our audience or, or the person we're speaking to. That person may be saying, yeah, I remember what happened the last time the national government was de-emphasized and local government had the, had the uh, emphasis. We know what happened then, slavery, segregation, lynching. So that's not the impression we want to leave. So you, you need to keep that stuff in mind and, and pick your words and, and, and make uh, uh, caveats uh, and, and make sure you're understood. I mean, you're not, it's, there's no perfect guarantee that you're going to be understood, but you got to at least keep that in mind and you'll, you'll avoid mistakes, avoid misunderstandings. And there are a lot of other examples I could think up uh, with, a, with a few minutes time of how, you know, we say one thing, but it's not heard by the other person. As, as the way we intend it. So we need to be sensitive about that. Libertella asks, which top three books would you recommend for an anarcho-capitalist Christmas? <laughs> I didn't come prepared with the, <laughs> with the, my reading list of anarcho-capitalists. I would read The Conscience of, Conscience of Anarchism by Gary Chartier, my good friend. And you know, I know if I start naming books, I'll, I'll overlook uh, uh, ones that I'll regret having overlooked. And, 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 and I don't want to be neglecting any uh, great authors or friends uh, or friends of mine who have uh, written some good books. So uh, uh, start with that one. He's got, I think, readings in the back or, you know, you can find stuff. Uh, uh, he probably I know he mentions other books, um, but that's a good basic introduction. It's not, you know, it's not meant to be a total full blown philosophical defense. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, Michael Humer's book on uh, political authority, the, uh, the question of political authority, I think maybe called, is really worth looking at. He writes for the common person. It's very intelligent, but it's it's plain plainly worded. And and while it not may not be the full case uh, that you'd want to master and be able to present to other people, it's a darn good way to uh, uh, broach the subject with people because it says you know how come why is the state or why are the we talk about the state. There's a, an illegitimate aggregation to begin with. Why are the individuals who who uh, work for the state uh, able to do things we're not allowed to do? You and I are not allowed to do. I mean, it starts off with sort of that basic uh, question. I think that's a very good uh, a way to begin thinking about this. So there's two. Uh, speak, speaking of Michael Humer, we're going to have him here on Liberty Me Live on January 5th. So mm -hmm. keep an eye out for that. Uh, Mary made an interesting note in chat. Uh, she says, Marshall Fritz taught the Ransberger pivot, a technique for establishing ethos with the other person. For example, I too am concerned about the poor and then finish with uh, how you simply have a different path to help them. Uh, Marshall established advocates for self-government to teach those communication principles. I think that's a, a very interesting approach. Marshall, I knew Marshall. I miss Marshall still. He's been gone a few years now. Uh, he had a real talent for that. Uh, he knew how to talk to people, uh, and uh, we need, yeah, we need people to study uh, 
that method. Uh, um, and so, you know, Marshall, Marshall was great, a uh, very humane person, and uh, no one could doubt his humanity. You know, another person to, to look at, and there's lots of these shorter YouTube uh, videos you can find, is Milton Friedman. Look at those YouTube videos uh, from var the various shows he did, uh, Free to Choose, his own series, where at the end they would have uh, him uh, exchanging with, uh, with adversaries, or you'll find examples of him taking questions from uh, audiences on different occasions. Study how he talks to people who are challenging his position on, uh, you know, uh, market his market positions on things, minimum wage, do you care about the poor? I mean, he was a master at, talk, you know, connecting with people. And, uh, I, I would recommend you look at those videos closely and see how he handles that. Always a smile. He's friendly. He's tolerant. He doesn't uh, ever show irritation with the question. And he just has a real way of, uh, you know, when someone says, well, you know, greed, what about greed? And, you know, just go watch that one on greed. It's fa it's fabulous. He, he was a master at that. He had such a way of, uh, of making himself and his position sound just so damn reasonable. So anything that was not that position just sounded almost, you know, l like tyranny. And it, it's such an amazing way to, you know, pose it not only to the people that you're talking to, but for, for those watching. And it certainly worked well for him. He it was such a, an amazing debater. You can learn, uh, I'm going to put out. You can learn that if you, if you pay attention and watch it. You can, you can do it. I'm going to put out a last call for questions here and let people know what's going on here this next week at Liberty Me Live. Uh, not a whole lot going on next week, but uh, tomorrow we've got Cal Molinay's monthly show, uh, Fight, uh, Fight the Matrix. He talks about anarchy. He's an excellent communicator. Hope, hope you can uh, check him out. He's a rising star in the movement. Thursday night, we've got the one and only Butler Schaefer. He's going to be talking on the, top of the topic of his book, uh, In Restraint of Trade, the uh, Big Business Campaign Against Comp Competition, 1918 through 1938. He's you know, just a tremendous resource on this. Uh, this is his second talk. On Liberty Me Live this month, and we're going to have him two more times next month as well. So definitely check him out. He's going to be back here a lot. Saturday, we've got a talk by Zach Goschenauer on uh, the legacy of Gordon Tullock. So if you've been putting off getting into public choice, come in, ask your questions, get some reading suggestions. Tullock is definitely someone you should know. He's a, a tremendous resource for, for Liberty. And then next week, we've got some, some fun ones. Uh, Tuesday, uh, Angela Keaton and Lucy Steigerwald are going to be talking about uh, what else? War and uh, kind of the anti-war tradition. So check us out. Uh, you can find the upcoming classes for the short term at liberty.me slash live. We've got a lot of stuff coming up in the next month. So hope to see you all back here. Uh, Jeffrey T uh, Tucker asks, let me ask about the use of the phrase social justice. More libertarians are using it in a favorable way. Uh, last night here at Liberty Me Live, we had uh, a SFL campus coordinator, Elizabeth Tate. She gave a talk on that. Uh, and yet I think Hayek absolutely ripped into that idea. What's your view towards being adaptable on even these phrases? No, I think that's a useful phrase, uh, social justice. I think we, ate, we did uh, dump it or avoid it too quickly. Hayek was one of the big reasons. Uh, but, you know, it's been used and I think defended well by Roderick Long and other and other people. It, cause it, I think what it does is goes to systemic injustice. Not that, you know, not just a single individual act of injustice, which is sort of isolated, uh, cut off from uh, from other things, but there, there can be systems of injustice. And uh, I don't think it violates uh, methodological individualism to talk in terms of, of social, ju uh, social justice as a, you know, corrective for the systemic uh, injustice. So, so I, yeah, I endorse its use. I mean, let's be clear about what we mean by it. And if, if we need to distinguish it from the way someone else might use it, like, you know, Robert Reich or somebody, uh, let's do that. Uh, but um, I, I, no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't avoid the term. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful talk as usual and a, a wonderful conversation. 
Uh, we have the Future of Freedom Foundation webinars here every month uh, on the third Tuesday of each month. So Sheldon will be back next month. Hope you can all uh, join us here again. Thanks everyone for coming and being a wonderful audience. And thank you again, Sheldon. Hope to see you soon. My pleasure. Happy holidays. Take care, everyone.